is one example where they found very large skeletons, much larger than the average inhabitants of the region, and it's become kind of a mystery after um, reading certain articles about uh, this phenomenon. I have a, a, a little bit of an idea of what I think was going on in Lovelock, but uh, they have a couple of other cases where they have found these very, very large, uh, gigantic skeletal structures in uh, places in the Middle East. And for those, I really don't have any idea if they're real or, um, you know, what's going on, because many people say that those were fake skeletons. Um, in Lovelock, there isn't so much of a dispute in terms of the, uh, you know, realness of those skeletons because they were actually checked uh, for DNA and they were human. Um, they were not of the same origin of the inhabitants of the area. But uh, in the other examples, it is, uh, you know, people, there's nothing conclusive except for those images. And you can Google them. They uh, show these gigantic skulls. And so then a lot of people have, um, you know, believed that those are, are some kind of a hoax. So I wanted to read about, I actually wanted to read about those particular cases uh, along with this Lovelock case, but um, I just can't find enough information on them in terms of whether they're real or not. But as far as the Lovelock case is concerned, I actually think that they are uh, legit. And I think that the pictures, especially since they were published more than 100 years ago, um, I don't think that they are faked the way that, you know, you can do Photoshopping at, in modern in modern times. So eventually I will get to those other um, cave uh, findings from the Middle Eastern caves where they just found these gigantic uh, skeletal features and uh, we'll talk about them once I have a little more information but I guess today will just be a primer for that with this particular case. So it's the ancient uh, giants of Nevada and the mystery of Lovelock Cave. Uh, this is from earthmysteriesnews.com So Let's begin. Was North America once inhabited by a race of giants, according to an old legend supported by several challenging archaeological finds? It is possible. Many Native American tribes tell stories about the long-forgotten existence of a race of humans that were much taller and stronger than ordinary men. These giants are described as both brave and barbaric, and legends often mention their cruelty towards whomever they pleased. The Bayute, a tribe that settled in Nevada, in the Nevada region thousands of years ago, have an outstanding legend about a race of red-haired giants called the Sita Ka. The ancestors of the Bayute described them as savage and inhospitable cannibals. In the northern Bayute language, Sita Ka literally means uh, tool eaters. Legend has it that the giants came from a distant island by the cross by crossing the ocean on rafts built using the fibrous tool plant. As odd as it may sound, this legend repeats itself all over the Americas, suggesting it might be an incomplete chronicle of a real event that happened long ago. In the Chronicles de Peru, 16th century Spanish conquistador Pedro de Cieza de Leon recorded an ancient Peruvian tale about the origin of the South American giants. According to legend, they came by sea in rafts of reed after the manner of large boats. Some of the men were so tall that the knee down they from the knee down they were as big as the length of an ordinary fair 
oversized man could the giants of Peru and the Siteca have been survivors of a massive cataclysm who took refuge on the American continent legends tell that the Siteca waged war on the Paiute and all other neighboring tribes spreading terror and devastation finally after years of conflict and the tribes united against the common enemy and began to decimate them the last remaining red-haired giants were chased off the sought shelter inside a cave the tribe started a fire at the cave entrance suffocating and burning alive the siteka those driven out by the smoke were also killed the tribes then sealed off the mouth of the cave so that no one might set eyes on those who had once plagued their land. They were all but forgotten until a random event brought them back to light in 1886. A mining engineer named John T. Reed happened to hear the legend from a group of Paiutes while prospecting near Lovelock, Nevada. The Indians told him that the legend was real and that the cave was located nearby. When he saw the cave for himself, Reed knew he was onto something. Reed was unable to begin digging himself, but news spread and soon Lovelock Cave was attracting attention. Unfortunately, the attention was profit-driven as guano deposits were discovered inside. A company started by miners David Pugh and James Hart began excavating the precious resource in 1911 and had soon shipped more than 250 tons to a fertilizer company in San Francisco. Any artifacts that might have been discovered were probably neglected or lost. After the surface layer of guano had been mined, strange objects started to surface. This led to an official excavation being performed in 1912 by the University of California and one other place in 1924. Reports told about thousands of artifacts being recovered, some of them being truly unusual. Although their claims have not been verified, it comes as no surprise, sources said, the mummified remains of several red-haired ancient giants were found buried in the cave, measuring between 8 to 10 feet in height. These mummies have since been referred to as the Lovelock Giants. Another intriguing find was a pair of 15-inch long sandals that showed signs of having been worn. Allegedly, other unusual large, unusually large items were recovered, but have since been locked away in museum warehouses and private collections. A piece of evidence that remains on site until this day is a giant handprint embedded on the boulder inside Lovelock Cave. We won't go into further debate pertaining to this aspect and its implications. Needless to say, this discovery has led many into believing the Paiute legend of the Siteka might be more than just folklore. According to the same time as the second Lovelock cave excavation, another dig revealed a set of equally disturbing finds. According to a 1931 article published in the Nevada Review Minor, two giant skeletons had been found buried in a dry lake bed close to Lovelock, Nevada. The oversized remains measured 8.5 feet respectively and 10 feet in height and were mummified in a manner similar to the one employed by ancient Egyptians. So you can see the height difference between these extraordinarily tall uh, you know, the, the ones that were found in the lake bed and an average man's height. Um, I think it's uh, uh, 
bodies were also mummified in a, with some sort of a gummy material, they said. But you can see that, um, you know, the, the men are reaching just about it there, a little above the hip bone of this creature, but you can see how long the femur is. It's just extraordinarily tall. Another common trait between these mummified giants remains the ones discovered as far south as Lake Titicaca is the presence of red hair. While some scientists believe the reddish color is a result of the interaction with the environment in which they were buried, the mummies verify the legends which describe the Siteca and their kin as red-haired giants. Proponents of alternative history believe that these violent giants were none other than the biblical Nephilim, the forsworn offspring of the sons of God with the daughters of men. If this is true, there is little chance we might get to see any of the giant mummies. Those interested in keeping history secret will never disclose their location. Okay, so that was kind of a short article. But we'll go to um, another one in a second. So uh, basically, it's it's pretty interesting that there was, um, you know, a legend. It seems to be true because the cave that they were talking about uh, did contain mummified remains. They contained artifacts like this huge uh, sandal, you know, a 15-inch long sandal you know, probably would be for somebody who is uh, that height. You can kind of imagine a really, I, I, I don't remember what um, size shoes someone like Shaq wears, but I thought it was like a size 21 or something like that. Anyway, they had, they found a lot of art, artifacts and some of them included these amazing duck decoys. It's a little hard to see in this picture, but I think in the other article, uh, they're going to talk about it. So there'll be a little bit of repetition when we get to that, um, but that's okay. All right, so let me get to that article then. Okay, so this article is from Skeptoid, and um, it's it's giving the alternative possibilities in terms of what could have been, you know, going on here, because it seems that some of the stories and legends can be traced back to a very specific origin, and uh, so they'll go through that here, and there'll obviously be some repetition of information. But here is this article. The Red-Haired Giants of Lovelock Cave In western Nevada, on the outskirts of Humboldt Sink, is a small cave. It's hot and dry and isolated, but it wasn't always so. It was once part of an enormous lake, Lahontan, a Pleistocene era lake some three, 13,000 years ago, and at the time one of North America's largest lakes, but it eventually dried up, leaving a number of smaller lakes, among which was Humboldt Lake. The cave was on its shore, and in it lived a race of natives who hunted and fished and enjoyed a life of plenty. But there's a shocking twist. Research this people, and you'll find that the archaeological and historical evidence tells us that they were not common Native Americans. They were the Siteka, a race of red-haired giants, ten feet tall, who terrorized their neighbors with cannibalism. So before we pass, um, you can see these duck decoys that were made, uh, that were amazingly well-made and also well-preserved. Uh, so, you know, they were duck hunters, they were hunters in general, but, you know, just the fact that they had these um, is pretty amazing. You can see how, how well they are, um, have, were kept in the cave system. The cave is real, and you can drive to it via a long dirt road from nearby Lovelock, Nevada, a small farming town that has grown amidst the moist soil of the sink. The stories are real too. All you need to do is Google for red-haired giants, and you'll find a raft of websites repeating the same tale. Guano miners in the cave found 
found so many relics that in 1912 they turned the site over to a University of California anthropologist who recovered thousands of artifacts. You'll read that an oral tradition passed down by Paiute Indians tells how they eventually defeated the Siteka giants by trapping them inside their cave and smoking them to death. And you will read how they recovered artifacts, included human bones split open for their marrow and bearing the marks of stone knives. What you won't read is any record of these allegedly giant bones having ever been preserved for study. Some say that they've been covered up or deliberately hidden away in locked cabinets in secure sections of museum collections, but most sources that discuss the story speculate that the bones were simply lost over time. It's a fact that earliest excavations of Lovelock Cave were exceedingly destructive and unscientific in the extreme. So let's take a look at the known history of Lovelock Cave to see when and where these red-haired giants may have lived and died. The cave was formed in limestone by wave action along the shore of Humboldt Lake, and its earliest evidence of human habitation goes back about 4,000 years, according to radiocarbon dating of the oldest artifacts. Today's anthropologists call these people the Lovelock culture. The Lovelock period lasted some 3,000 years, during which they left us a wealth of stunning artifacts, finely crafted baskets, exquisite duck decoys made from tool fibers, a sagebrush and tool sandals, and so on. The cave was most intensively occupied from 1500 BCE until the year 440, when a collapse cut off easy access to most of the cave. From that point on, bats became the primary residents, burying the artifacts under a layer of thick guano. By the time of the collapse, the Lovelock culture had been supplanted by northern Paiutes. The Paiute name for their predecessors was Sedeku, literally translating as under tool or tool mat house dwellers, meaning that they lived in huts made of tool mats. The Paiutes continued their use of the outer part of the cave until 1829, when whites began populating the region. Any remaining Paiutes were killed off or driven off in 1833, when expeditions led by Joseph Walker explored the area. In 1911, a pair of men from Lovelock discovered the cave's vast guano deposits and spent a year digging it out and shipping it to a buyer in San Francisco. From the beginning, their work was impeded by the density of artifacts mixed throughout the guano. Most of it they discarded into a rubbish heap outside the cave. In 1912, the work proved to be no longer worthwhile. When a meter or two down, the proportion of ancient artifacts exceeded the proportion of guano. They contacted the University of California and told them the cave was theirs to take over if they wanted, and the department had sent anthropologist Llewellyn L. Loud to check it out. The Humboldt Silk was well known for its open archaeological sites pertaining to the Lovelock culture, but this was a previously unknown location and it turned out to be the greatest yet. Nobody in the fields of anthropology or archaeology have ever received a greater bounty than Lao did on that day. To the amazement of the scientific community, he collected over 10,000 artifacts from the rubbish heap and various regions of the cave, mostly along the walls where the miners had not cut. Loud 
Ed's workload was such that it took him 17 years before he was finally able to publish a comprehensive account of his findings. In none of it did he report anything pertaining to giants. In 1924, Loud and M.R. Harrington, with a number of Bayute assistants, continued the exploration. Again, no giants were mentioned. Further expeditions in 1936 by N. Nelson and Heiser and Krieger collected relics, but again, no giants. Krieger turned in 1949, 1950, and 1965, and still no giants. In fact, Many parties representing many universities and museums have worked at the site. Not a single one of them reported giants, although quite a lot of human remains were rediscovered and remain available for study in museum collections. A complete radiometric history has been constructed of Lovelock Cave. We have human remains from all periods, yet none of the literature happens to mention what you think would be an earth-shaking fact that there were giants. The red hair is true, but simply because the pigment in dark hair nearly always turns red after centuries of burial in certain temperatures and soil chemistry. This is evident in mummies from all over the world, and even evident in ancient Native American scalps. There is no science-based reason to suspect that the Lovelock culture had red hair. It was almost certainly black, like all Native Americans. The cannibalism is also true, but based only on very few human bones found at Lovelock Cave, that they had been split for the removal of their marrow. All others had not been. The rarity of such bones there suggests that it was an exceedingly uncommon practice, probably only in times of great famine, and was certainly not the norm. So, where did this idea come from that the Lovelock culture was a tribe of red-haired cannibalistic giants? Most sources claim it is a Paiute oral tradition, so I did my best to read as much Paiute legend that I could find, having no actual Paiutes on hand to recite oral traditions for me. I found their lore to be speckled with occasional mentions of lone giants in fanciful tales. I found no mention of a tribe called the Siteka, a tribe of giants, or any red-haired anybody, cannibalistic or not. The Pyramid Lake Bayou tribe maintains an active web presence and archives a number of tales, and although you'd think such a prominent urban legend would be mentioned with, with what they publish, it is not. What I found, in fact, is that every mention of the Siteka appears only in paranormalist books and websites that promote the claim that a Bayute oral tradition says the red-haired giant cannibals were real. Every mention of the Siteka uh, appears in scholarly books and articles about the Lovelock culture with no mention whatsoever of red hair or gigantism. If you're looking for the legend, search for Sideka. And if you're looking for the true history, search Sideku. Another a author, Adrian Mayer, in her 2005 book, Fossil Legends of the First Americans, speculates that the giant legends have been due to misidentification of Ice Age megafauna bones in the region that led to beliefs in ancient giants. Mammoths and giant sloths have their remains all over the western United States, and early discoverers may well have had no better idea of what they could have been. There's also a much more general and common folklore about giant Native American skeletons stemming from the non-expert discovery of many skeletons nationwide that had been buried or disarticulated with the bones separated enough to make it look like a seven or eight foot tall person. It turns out that all the stories can be traced back to a single primary source, a book written in 
things and claims. At the end of chapter 4, she tells the story of how her people rose up against a small tribe of barbarians who would attack her people and eat them. Hundreds of years ago, the Paiutes pursued them into a cave overlooking Humboldt Lake and filled the entrance to the cave with firewood. The barbarians were given the choice to come out and join the Paiutes and cease their evil ways, but they refused to answer, and the Paiutes burned them. She wrote that they were said to have reddish hair and said she owned a dress trimmed with their red hair that has been passed down through the generations. She never mentioned giants at all. And so the story comes full circle, and the origin of what later writers exaggerated is ascertained, at least to some level of likelihood. Evidence tells us the Lovelock culture was not largely cannibalistic, but there may have been some bands that were to some degree, and as a dress was passed down through the generations, the legend of their hair being red probably rose just as chemistry would predict. Alas, we never do find any evidence of gigantism which is a shame because it would have been really neat. But what's also really neat is digging in and constructing a radiometric history of the Lovelock culture. Having a better and more complete picture of the Paiutes and the Lovelock culture with a cultural history consistent with the archaeological history is not only correct, it's far more respectful of Native American history than are the wild internet-based stories of huge giants running around eating people. That's not how the Lovelock peoples lived, and my guess is that the Paiutes probably don't wish to be perceived as promoting such nonsense. Okay, that was by Brian Dunning. Okay, so that sort of clarifies some of uh, what was going on, but the thing is, um, they did find artifacts over there. The problem is none of those artifacts are available, uh, which becomes very suspicious that they don't have anything uh, as far as those skeletal remains are concerned, which is the real question here. Um, you know, where, where did they go? Why are they uh, not being shown? And why are they not part of, you know, a, um, a large collection or a display? So what uh, I think happened, and this is somewhat based on this particular article, is um, the, the fact that all of this, um, all of the stories based on this particular tribe and their, uh, you know, or the way that they lived, cannibalistic, and whatever, they, you know, all of those legends came from a single book that was written in the late 1800s. Um, prior to that, they don't have anything. They don't have stories of giants. They don't have stories of cannibals. They don't have any of these stories, but yet this one woman who writes this book tells this story of cannibals, but not of giants. She talks about red-haired cannibals, basically, um, that were then put, you know, sort of uh, pushed into a cave system and, uh, and basically secured away from the other tribes. Um, so where, where do we get these, uh, huge skeletal remains from? Because there were images in the 1800s of these humongous, you know, giants. Um, so if we go back to that image, I'm going to go back to it. Okay, so, uh, this is the main image. It was printed in a paper in the late 1800s after her book was published, and um, it was also, uh, what it turns out is this particular excavation, so if you remember, there were those miners that had gone into the cave system 
as to, you know, how are they going to make good on this particular investment? And uh, I don't know who they <laughs> spoke to, but apparently some individuals with, I, I'm not sure if it was Barnum and Bailey's or which circus company um, they became involved with, but there was a circus a, a sideshow going on at the same time. I'm not exactly sure because this was very, uh, there was very sketchy information on this part of the, the story, but it kind of makes sense that, you know, if you recall, um, you know, in the old style circuses or fairs, uh, so this might have even been like a local kind of fair company or something like that. They used to have those, um, uh, like, uh, I, I, mystery areas, um, anomalies, like these little bins that you would walk into and see like a two-headed person or a woman with a beard or just, you know, these weird types of things. Sometimes it was just people with a lot of tattoos or um, whatever. And so they were designed uh, to scare kids basically, or just, you know, be like oddities. These were like freak shows basically. And um, apparently somebody within that particular area of work was contacted by these, by the mining company. And they said, look, you can make a lot of money if, uh, you, you know, you show these very exaggerated bones type structures. And they used to have things like that. You know, they used to have um, displays like that and they knew how to create them. So, uh, for example, this particular one, you can even see the way that it's sort of as if it's standing with a kind of style. The, the one leg is out a little bit. Um, so what they, and, and remember they said that there was like a gummy, um, like a, some sort of a gummy gauze on them as if, uh, it was like an Egyptian, like an ancient Egyptian mummy. Um, so there were things that were not making sense, but yet these were a phenomenon that the people of the time would be familiar with because they were doing a lot of mummy excavations at the same time. And so, uh, what I believe happened was they recreated bone structures from very large pieces that they found. It could have been some animal bones, but like they said in this article, that they could space out a series of bones and basically reconstruct a, a, a creature or a person, um, you know, for photograph's sake, that uh, you, you could look this large. And I think that that is probably what happened because if there had actually been stories or legends of giants, they would have said that they're giants. There really isn't any reason to hide that in the ancient tales. Um, but none of the ancient tales talk about it. The only person who... Um, it mentions even the tale of this of this particular cannibalistic tribe was that woman, but she still didn't say that they were giants. So I think that that legend probably existed that they were some uh, cannibals. Probably, you know, they they were there were there were some uh, examples within the cave of marrow being eaten from human remains, um, and this became a problem for the, some of the people in in the tribe, obviously, and, uh, and they got rid of those individuals in the cave. I think that story is true. I don't think she made up anything, but it seemed to get embellished right after the miners, um, you know, met up with this, uh, circus mentality. It's not clear who they talked to, but somebody within that realm, uh, and then without anybody really, you know, without the University of California becoming aware of it or any kind of information, this photograph was published in a local newspaper in the Nevada Mining Times or something like that. And uh, you would think that, um, you know, they would show it to the university, but I think they realized that, you know, it would be figured out that um, this was a faked skeletal structure and so they didn't that's the, probably the reason that nobody has these bones they've all gone missing if there was such a discovery like this they would absolutely even if it was
was the 1800s, they would not have lost them. They would have kept them. It was, it would have been a major archaeological find when I first read this art, the other article, uh, and the similar ones to it that promote the idea of these red-haired giants. I really thought that, oh, this, they might have been, uh, because they were specific to say that they were white red-haired giants, so I thought that, oh, maybe uh, these were skeletal remains of Vikings that had come over, because there's some evidence that Vikings actually traveled much earlier than, um, you know, uh, formally believed in terms of uh, also the distance that they were able to travel and that they had settlements in North America, Newfoundland, and certain parts of Canada. Um, and there is pretty substantial evidence to show that that is the case, that there was some kind of travel of Viking explorers in those very early years, much uh, earlier than Columbus or anybody else that was doing exploration. Um, and so I thought, well, maybe some of them might have come, you know, uh, into the lower plains as well, but the thing is, all of those Viking expeditions, they seem to have settled uh, on coastal land, so the, this would have been along the coast. It would, it would be really surprising if they traveled so far inland to get to Nevada. You know, it's, it's, it's a long trek for any kind of group of people to be traveling deep inside the country and all of those other um, structures that seem to be from those Viking explorations are all along coastal Canada, um, which, you know, makes sense. They would want to be close to the water and, and uh, you know, food supply and everything, and it would be kind of difficult to make an expedition that deep in, you know, especially at that time in history. But I still thought, oh, that, that maybe these were like second or third generation, and that that would explain the red hair. And, you know, it's very convincing when you read these kinds of stories on the internet. But then I started reading other articles, and it is true that um, every, uh, you know, skeletal remains that have remained within certain uh, zones where they have, um, uh, where the hair has oxidized, get this iron red color. Um, it doesn't matter what their original color is, the hair oxidizes and it turns red. So what could happen, let, let's say that um, somebody, an amateur who is not aware of this, uh, sees a, any kind of an old skeletal remain that actually has hair on it, that hair will be red. And if they don't have enough information about it, um, they, a legend or some something might start saying that, oh, the people that previously inhabited this area used to have red hair because they just didn't have the scientific background to understand that it's a common phenomenon around the world. Not everybody has red hair. It's actually a very rare trait. And so um, I think that the red hair quality probably was something that was tacked on right around the 1700s when some of the remains were being found by uh, the, the natives that were living in that region. And if they did use some of it for clothing, like the woman said she had a garment that where this long red hair was sewn in, uh, you know, it would it would look like red hair. It would look, it would look like oxidized sort of uh, dry string, basically. And, um, but, you know, part of that, uh, legend would, would then be that, oh, the people from those caves that had been, um, you know, isolated in, in that cave system that were cannibals, oh, they also had red hair, because that was as far as her story went. Um, nobody was talking about giants, though. So, um, the red hair thing is kind of explained, and the issue of the giantism, I really think, directly had to do with those particular miners wanting to make good on their investment because it happened right at the point where they couldn't get any more guano. Suddenly, these two amazing structures in pristine condition with gauze, you know, for the gauze to have lasted within a, a lake bed. I mean, there were, there were things that people were not thinking about, um, but, you know, these... these uh, situations where these perfect skeletons were found with red hair intact and so forth, um, where, you know, photographs were taken for the newspapers. But the universities were investigating at the time 
possibly make some money on this anomaly and I don't know if these uh, skeletons toured you know just to show people or, or what I'm not actually sure um, what they did or why would it, it just came in the newspaper and I, it seems like it was as a promotion uh, for them to be eventually on display um, but I, I think either a scientist or someone at the time realized if they did see them in actuality uh, that either they were not all human bones or it was a hodgepodge of bones that were placed in such a way and that it was not going to stand up and since they had those um, universities uh, those uh, scientists were there um, for the next like 20 or 30 years it was going to be difficult for them to do this kind of a thing so it just was like a flash in the in the pan where they uh, put out this article and they never really had a chance to catch on in terms of making money for them personally uh, but then a legend developed around it that oh the bones were lost and oh they're hiding the bones and they don't want us to know about giants and whatever I don't think that that ever would have been an issue um, it would have been something that probably especially at that time it's not like they were trying to hide anything about uh, finding giants in the region um, I can see that in modern times there might be a little bit of an issue of, you know, of people trying to hide some of the articles that are found. Uh, this seems to be an issue that see, occurs sometimes in Egyptian digs where um, there is a, an effort by the current Egyptian government uh, to promote the idea that the Egyptians of ancient times looked like the Arabs that live in Egypt now. The Arab invasion occurred um, much later. So, you know, Egypt is in Africa. They would all be Africans. They were not going to be Arabs. But yet, if you look at all of the, um, all of the, uh, when, when they try to do these, like, time lapses to sort of show you, oh, what uh, Tutankhamun must have looked like or, or whatever, uh, they always show them as Middle Eastern. They wouldn't have been Middle Eastern. They would have been African. And uh, this is uh, something that goes on in Egyptian digs all the time, where when they find very dark um, examples of, like, uh, what do you call it, like the hieroglyphs show dark-skinned people, uh, this apparently, according to some, there has been an effort to lighten the skin to make it more reddish-looking. Um, I don't know if they could have done that to all of them, because there's going to be an issue that's that would occur just when air and light hit those uh, hieroglyphs anyway, that it's going to lighten over time. But um, in some of the deeper uh, excavations where they haven't been exposed to the elements, they are much darker. And according to some people, they are purposefully being lightened as a rule within the government to promote the idea that Egyptians were of some kind of Arab origin. And they absolutely would not have been. The Arabs came much later um, as an invader group, uh, much, much later. So, um, you know, the people of the upper, uh, upper Africa would be African. So, um, there is a lot of stuff that does go on to kind of promote certain ideas and I can understand if there was uh, something like that happening in modern times where an effort, a concerted effort to hide information of what was found. Like for example, there were um, some excavations done in China where they showed um, people that there was a tribe within China that uh, seemed to be of Roman origin and the Chinese government was apparently hiding this information for a very long time. Eventually it did come out that, um, you know, this was uh, an ex ex exhibition that was done by Rome so many centuries ago and they did land in China and you can actually see the genetic remnants of the people of that region because many of them have blue eyes and a slightly different bone structure um, with this Caucasian mixture that had occurred but it, the Chinese government never wanted to admit it so there are things like that that absolutely occur in modern times but in the late 80, 1880s um, I don't think the University of California or Nevada or any of them would have 
it was only the photograph that was leaked out into the newspapers on purpose, and they were never presented with anything that they could solidly, um, you know, investigate and look at because they would have seen that it was a hodgepodge that it was kind of, you know, put together by an amateur and then, I don't know, some sort of a gummy substance was placed on top of it so that it looked like a mum mummified remain. Um, but then the whole the scam would have been exposed. So I don't think they did that. What they did instead was send in a single bone for them to test. And uh, it, they tested it to be of human origin and of Caucasian origin, but they didn't have any method of uh, figuring out how old that bone structure was, so who knows what was actually sent in. Um, I don't think they would have lost something of this value, though. I just, I don't think they were actually shown this particular thing. This came in the newspaper, and it started the never-ending rumors of these Lovelock cave giants. Um, and like the author said, these are primarily in, uh, are, what do you call it, paranormal or or these kinds of uh, articles uh, where they're promoting this idea and the idea that there was some sort of a cover-up. I, I think cover-ups definitely exist within archaeology, but I don't think that they would have existed right at this time. There was no need for it. Um, and I don't think this would have interfered with anybody's uh, historical point of view of, of what was going on. Right now, it's a little, there's always um, political issues within certain countries and their belief system about their history and, and so forth and they want to promote certain concepts um, so that's that's a separate issue altogether but in the late 1800s it seems that the ex excavations that were done 20 year long excavations or longer show that this was a group of tool makers that you know had um, a myriad of artifacts, very skillfully made artifacts within that cave system and, and the surrounding areas, and that uh, there was some cannibalistic activity, so there was truth to the story that some cannibals existed um, within that area and possibly the other part of the story where they said that they... Um, you know, secured them in the cave and, and got rid of them. That's probably even true, too. Uh, the, but like I said, they would have mentioned giants if the giant part was part of their story, but it really wasn't. Um, the only part of their story was the red hair, which I think might have come afterwards when people actually saw, you know, uh, natives actually went into the caves and saw some of the remains and that they had this long red hair. They might have just assumed that uh, the hair was originally red and they knew that those people were the cannibals because that was the legend and so that part of it might have been tacked on. Um, but I, they, they never said they were giants. The only the giant business came from this photograph and then there were also some large skulls that were found but again those the pieces of those skulls um were were not were, were one they don't have them right now again they've gone missing and it's uh it's possible that they found some large skulls but uh you know, they, it was, again, a situation where they were never able to identify clearly was a, it a something that was glued together or, you know, somehow put together or what was going on. So this newspaper printed these photographs and then those bones just disappeared. There would have been an uproar if there had been a legit find like that. And, you know, the actual... Um, guys who were doing the digs, the, these, these were teams of people, they would have been the ones to find them. So how is it that, you know, these skeletons are found by some mystery individuals published in a paper, and then um, they're all, they've all gone missing, whereas the actual archaeologists are digging there, and they don't find these things. Um, so something is a little bit uh, questionable about these Lovelock cave giants.
giants. I think that there was definitely a culture living there and they could have been, you know, a small group of cannibals. Whatever that evidence seems to exist and that's not being hidden in any way. Um, and the, the giant part of this story seems to be a little bit made up. Now, I don't know if this is the case with all of these giant stories because around the world they seem to be showing these pictures, but then um, you find out that there's a little bit of a scam going on too and then they don't have any of these bones. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't really know if this is a worldwide scam trying to promote the concept of, uh, you know, the ancient Nephilim kind of a thing. Um, is that what's going on or, or what is happening? Or were, are there, were there giants and people just, uh, that there is some worldwide conspiracy to hide them? I'm not, I'm not totally sure about all of this. Um, you know, especially with the modern photographs. I know that they can be photoshopped and a lot can be done with them. Uh, this one was not photoshopped, but then they can do a lot of scamming with the putting it together and the fact that nobody was able to investigate the actual structure makes it very suspicious and, of course, that they've gone missing. Um, so I'm, I'm still a little bit, I, I would like to get more information about the other, um, uh, you know, giant skeletal remains that have been found supposedly in other parts of the world. Um, the other thing is, you know, if you look at the uh, Sumerian tablets and a lot of the hieroglyphs that they had, and other hieroglyphs, the carvings that they had, uh, they usually show a the king or whatever as a much larger, almost double the size of the attendants. Now, some have said that, oh, that was just an adult and the attendants are all children or, you know, whatever. But that alone makes it seem like there could have been a much larger um group of individuals existing at a certain time, whether they were ancient aliens, uh, you know, humanoid looking like us, but just larger, uh, existing at a certain time, ruling over the population, possibly even genetically uh, adjusting some of the population, etc. And this was captured in those Sumerian, uh, you know, in Sumerian carvings. And, and then, I don't know if these, uh, skeletal remains or remains of those original um, ancients, but it's very hard to tell what what's actually going on because, you know, there is no one, uh, so far, no legit source is claiming that they've found anything like this other than the oddball case of actual gigantism where uh, they're able to even genetically test at this point that, yeah, this individual had this this particular uh, genetic situation where they um, were growing. Um, but usually there is some information even at the grave site about the individuals that seem to have that as, as the issue. So uh, it's unclear. And again, I know that there can be cover-ups and things like that can happen, but I just don't know why this particular thing would be covered up. I do have a, a feeling that there could be people who want to promote certain ideas to match up with um, biblical information and that there might be some, um, you know, great need or want within the community to kind of promote these ideas. I think that's possible, but uh, I just don't know what the motivation for hiding it is because, you know, what, what, other than maybe protecting the concept that there was um, an ancient race that wasn't exactly human. Uh, that's the other possibility that there might be an effort to um, protect that kind of information. It's hard to know. And like I said in the articles that I've read, I just have not been able to get enough information because they're so flimsy, you know, and, and again, there's nobody has any bones or access to anything, so it's very hard to say. But as far as this case is concerned, I'm pretty sure that uh, the Lovelock Cave Giants were specifically designed by these miners uh, in addition with, you know, to whomever it was that they met within this um, community of circus or freak show fair people. And this photograph was uh, made, created, 
was, and it, I think it couldn't happen because of how long the excavations were going to, you know, go on. Like I said, 20 year long excavations that they wouldn't have been able to do the tour saying that these are love log giants because, um, the scientists would have come out and said, let, let us test this, and then it would have been shown. I think the plan was that those scientists would leave. I think they thought they were going to leave. Eventually, I don't think they planned on them staying for that long. Um, you know, 20 year long digs is pretty excessive. So it was something that um, I think they wanted to promote, but then they just couldn't do it. And, uh, and then a legend just developed on its own based on some of the actual legends, but this aspect was then just added, you know, and certain, um, certain groups just jumped on it and have kept that going, kept it alive, so to speak. Okay. So this was the case of the, uh, mysterious Lovelock giants and my opinion uh, on it and, and what I think might have happened. Um, I might not be correct. Maybe there were giants and they, they fit in the evidence, but, uh, you know, I have a feeling that there was a little bit of scamming going on too. Okay, guys. So I hope you have a great night and